have a huge portfolio, but you were really an early mover in using NFTs in the gaming industry. In a lot of your games, specifically the metaverse ones, focus on the idea of virtual land ownership, the sandbox, the obvious example. How do you see that evolving? Well, I mean, one of the reasons why we were so drawn to NFTs is because anyone who's a gamer would appreciate the fact that their virtual items that they have inside games is one that they feel they should own already. Most gamers don't realize that actually all the items that they apparently play with and have earned, whether they paid money for it or earned it through gameplay, actually it doesn't belong to them. The terms of service makes it very clear that it belongs to the game company. Uh, you know, I bought my first virtual item, I think maybe 30 years ago or so in a, in a, in a multi-user dungeon. You know, I paid 20 bucks for it. And it was, it was one of those interesting experiences where for me it was as real as anything else. And I think today that is true probably for the 3.2 billion gamers out there. Everyone believes that they ought to own their virtual items. Now, whether they understand it or not is a different matter altogether. But, you know, intrinsically, they believe they should own it. And the gamers themselves around their communities believe they should own it too. Okay, well, when we're talking about ownership, if you own an actual home and you have the deed to that property, there's obvious utility and value in owning a home. It can be, you know, close to your office, close to your child's school, you have a kitchen you can cook in, it's shelter, it like protects you from the rain. What gives virtual land value? Why is it intrinsically valuable and digital property rights important by extension? Well, let me just uh, sort of illustrate another example and then we can go straight into virtual land and the network effects implied with it. Uh, in general, when we think of as, as, as a species, when we think about when we purchase something, we don't just purchase something for its pure utility. There is a value in that, of course, but there's a lot that goes into social identity and social statuses as well. So for instance, when you look at when you buy a Birkin bag, how much of that sort of uh, Birkin bag and value is the material quality around it? And in fact, 99.9% .9 is entirely virtual in construct. You just want to be seen with your Birkin bag. Exactly. The the network effect. That's right. Yeah. Um, but it's also what other people say about it. It's sort of that feeling of being part of a community as well of other people who have broken backs. Now, real estate functions in much the same way. Why would you want to live in Tribeca versus some place far away in Africa? Technically speaking, that house that you have can be bigger and larger and perhaps, you know, more majestic in another place, another country. But we want to live in New York. Again, it's because of the network effect. It's because of the people around. It's the influence that comes with it. And just in that same way, you know, when, you, when people ask you where you're from, they're not asking specifically, or even maybe which district you live in, for instance, where you live. It's a very common question. It's not that they're necessarily just trying to size you up. They're trying to understand what community you're in as well. Right? So, oh, you live in the peak, or oh, you're that kind of person, or you live in Tribeca, or you live in Brooklyn, right? These are parts of identifying who you are. And we choose to play and live in these places as a way of identifying us. And so, People do this in virtual worlds as well. When you say what games you play, for instance, actually you're saying what kind of a gamer you are, what kind of a community you're part of. And virtual land in the sandbox functions in exactly the same way. The difference about why virtual land and sandbox has meaning is because you now actually have real ownership. And that's a real big difference because, you know, if you don't actually have ownership, you can't allow for capital formation. You can't also allow for the ability for third party network effects to take place in a permissionless manner. The fact that I can own a house in the real world, for instance, is the reason why a bank can give me a 20 or 30 year mortgage. Hmm. Now for digital assets, that wasn't possible until you have blockchain where at least, you know, someone can now say, well, I know you own this asset, whatever that may be worth, I can give you the benefit of that capital formation, whether this generates yield and therefore I can do a 20 or 30 year forward or whatever that is that I can construct. And it may not be one to one how it is in the physical world, but I can now do that because I have the certainty of ownership. Okay, so obviously there's the context of gaming, and I know the next panel is going to focus a lot on gaming, and I don't want to uh, eat up too much of what they're going to talk about. But as you talk about kind of the idea of just digital property rights, obviously that goes well beyond the gaming sphere. That is everywhere. And I'm just wondering if you feel that that has developed enough, that there is enough structure around the idea of owning digital property at this point. Well, I think owning digital property is a relatively novel concept still. Uh, so I go to this concept around sort of what do we think is natural to us as in like natural rights, right? And I think that certainly for gamers, the idea that you should own your sort of game items feels natural to them. And for the communities around them, it feels natural too. So it is essentially an implied right, although 
technically speaking, because data, which is the construct in which is created and formed, um, doesn't have a sort of legal construct. Uh, it's therefore a terms of service, right? It's basically a con under contract law, which technically means that they can take away, you know, basically all, all your data rights just because you signed on a click-through agreement, which we think in and of itself is wrong. And I think this is the main thing that we need people to understand, that data is actually the natural resource of this metaverse, of Web3. And data is the valuable commodity in this place. When you think about 20, 30 years ago, when, when the internet came around, we were able to fairly price commodities in places like China or Vietnam or other places because people knew what the fair value was that that commodity was, was paid for. A farmer in China could charge a fair price of rice knowing that his rice was now sold for a certain value because the internet told him what the value was. The problem with data is we don't know this. The fact that we're all spending time on Facebook and Instagram, you know, um, well, there's no ticker next to us that says, today your time will earn you $50 or earn Facebook $50. We can maybe make an assumption, but we don't really know. Now, what does your relationship to your platform change when you realize how much money they're actually making from you? And they don't tell you this intentionally because, you know, it's to their benefit. It's a classic kind of arbitrage, except it's a different kind of knowledge arbitrage based on the data and the network effects that it can create. So property rights and data changes this because in the same way, that you, know, you can't send someone to slavery, for instance, right? Uh, you can't ask someone to work for free for you. And we think of the world, you know, everyone who plays you know, games, for instance, or everyone who spends time on Facebook, we think of them as working essentially for free because they add to the network effect. After all, if we all stop using Facebook or we all stop playing sort of, you know, Fortnite, for instance, actually the value of the game plummets to zero. Right, nothing is ever actually free in full. Correct free terms, and we've definitely That's learned right. that with free trading, for example. We know how that has played out over the uh, course of the meme stock era over the last several years. As we talk about property, of course, it's not just virtual land or physical land, whatever. There's also intellectual property rights, and I know that you have been making some investments as well into things like education and NFTs. How do you tie those two things together? So education is something that's very dear to us. Uh, part of the reason, and we've seen this with gamer time and gamers as well, you know, it's about value to society. One may argue about sort of what is gamers value to society. We don't have to go into this now. We do think it's very valuable. But for teachers, I think it's undeniable. Everyone agrees that teachers are very valuable to society, except they're amongst the least paid in society. So there's a little bit of a sort of disconnect here. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons we think that's the case is because there's not been, it's not been possible for them to have actual the benefits of the classic capital formations that you can have with property rights. Now, what we've seen with non-fungible tokens is that content turns into assets and that makes them platforms, right? That's basically sort of the general thesis. Now, if you actually have a teaching content and TinyTap, which was an acquisition we recently did, is the largest mobile teacher marketplace uh, serving about 8.6 million families today. And what's interesting about that is, is that teachers make about $100 a year, maybe $1,000 a year. Some teachers make tens of thousands, but that's a very small number. Uh, and it's basically based on the fact that people are sort of, you know, using the content, whether it's a parent or another teacher that's purchasing it. Now, imagine that you turn this into effectively a yield instrument where I can buy this piece of content that a teacher can make $1,000 a year. And I am happy to accept the 10% yield. Actually, that teaching content is now worth $10,000. And it's a very different factor in your life when a teacher, you know, adds $1,000 of supplemental income a year, or he makes tens of thousands of dollars selling his content as an asset. And that's what we've seen already with NFT artists, for instance. That's what happened there as well. But with teachers, we think it could be even bigger because teachers are amongst the biggest content creators in the world. And we also see another benefit here, which is that you know, we can now uh, sort of provide sort of financial value to teachers uh, and to educators around the world, not in a manner that is purely sort of from a charity standpoint, but actually as a working business model where I can invest in a teacher and it can benefit them as well. I think this is something that, uh, that we were really excited about. What else are you excited about? Are there any you know, similar opportunities that you see out there where you're like, hey, I can use monetization of these assets that already exist, make them a non-fungible token, we can have a mutual benefit here. I mean, what other opportunities like that are you looking to pursue? Well, there's so many, but I mean, I would say, you know, given the time, one of the opportunities- Top, that, top two, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> 30 seconds okay. each. <laughs> yeah, well, so the very, first, the very first one that I'm really excited about is what it means for children's education in terms of financial systems and economic systems. 
when you uh, engage things like you know digital property rights at a young age where they have to trade or they understand about money and value you know if you can teach our children algebra we can certainly teach them economics i would think but the problem is that we don't teach them anything on this until they go to college and they typically have debt and their first experience <laughs> with you know financial systems is owing money essentially a form of quasi indentured servitude so our perspective on this is actually if we teach our children about money and systems at a young age whether it's through games or other things with digital property rights we will actually create an entire generation of children who understand about financial systems who understand about risk who understand about money and it will be very different they can't be exploited the same way with credit cards or so on they'll be more careful they understand interest rates but right? these aspects that we think you know will actually change the world in a very significant manner if you take a look at what happened with axie infinity for instance mm -hmm. you've got you know millions of people in the philippines none of them are university educated right and actually understanding how a financial system in a game works for instance uh, having essentially a, a crypto uh, wallet instead of a credit card primarily because they weren't even allowed to have a credit card because it was financially not viable for them for them to do so broadly speaking anything that makes content which is really our human imagination has now the ability to become an asset right through non fungible tokens and everything that is an asset becomes a platform right in the same way that ownership of physical assets in the real world allow us to basically create new services on top of this in a permissionless fashion so you know whether this is music film entertainment um writing you know all these areas that have barely been touched in terms of creating those forms of forms of uh, content into assets you know this is all open right so platforms like sandbox create the first wave into that land ownership is one element of it but it's content creators that are using sandbox as a platform to do that right not that different from you know i'm basically launching something on 5th avenue mm -hmm. as a way to sort of launch my services to the world that's the first part but of course actually this will just mushroom to the rest of the to 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 uh, to a global phenomenon we believe all right so you've talked a lot about network effects and kind of these communities and and i want to get to dows because this was an actual real moment on one of my shows earlier today someone said a fellow anchor i was talking about a cryptocurrency stock that was rising he's like is it in the dow and i'm like which which dow he was like the dow and I was like, like a decentralized autonomous sort. He was like, no, the Dow Jones Industrial Average. So that was a nice, uh, you know, they sound the same. It's confusing. Um, but how do you see that fitting into the work you are doing and that particular method of organizing evolving? So our general perspective on DAOs is that it is, 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 and we're really excited about this because it provides a way for democracy and democratic systems to evolve, but at the pace of technology. When you start experimenting with sort of sort of uh, democratic systems, which is what a DAO really is, you know, it it can have very disastrous effects if you do this in the running of a country and you have to experiment and you can't really do the sort of MVP DAO approaches on, on an actual government. Uh, that would be a problem. But we can learn from this when you lose it in virtual systems, whether this is a metaverse, whether it's a you know um, a running of a uh, token system, whatever that may be, and we see this emerging. You know, you should expect that there's going to be thousands and thousands, if not tens of thousands, of DAOs operating. I also think DAOs could be the future of work and in terms of the future of companies as well. Like in the same way that companies are, in some cases, bigger than countries, I believe DAOs can be bigger than that as well. And the main point of this is that it's community interest. Now, the classic argument has always been, well, you know, if you have consensus by the masses, and how does anything move forward? And is there always always people going to argue? And you know, nothing happens. Well, I mean, welcome to democracy, right? The one thing about democratic systems is, yes, maybe things don't move as quickly. On the other hand, they have good self-correcting mechanisms yeah. provided that the community has the respective version of a national interest. And that's what we believe will happen. We, we think that you know, DAOs create a form of micro-communities and micro-nationalism inside these type of ecosystems that are forming. And that, you know, not to say that every DAO will succeed, just like every country doesn't succeed, but the ones that do, the ones that create that common thread are actually going to be ones from our perspective, um, sort of some of the biggest things because everyone has a stake in it, as opposed to where only a small minority yeah. has an interest in it. All right, we only have about 90 seconds left, and I make, want to make sure to get to this while talking about democracies. You and I chatted by phone about a week ago, and you were talking about democratic liberalists who are staunchly anti-crypto and how you kind of see this more broadly as just an outright war on capitalism. Can you just give us your hot take on that? So, I mean, this was something that I didn't really appreciate it until I was stuck in the U.S. because of COVID. Um, and my, my strong democratic um, sort of pro-liberal friends are actually uh, um, didn't like crypto. And I didn't understand that. I couldn't connect it until I discovered that they didn't like capitalism. Now, I don't, I don't mean that in the sense that 
they don't appreciate that the system of capitalism and democracy might be connected, but that capitalism has, particularly in America, been the source of great injustice and inequity for the last two or three decades. And so they see this as a problem. They see capitalism as an ultimately only monopolistic outcome and therefore you know, needs to be fought against. And so from my perspective, at least from an outsider perspective, I see this essentially as a different kind of war that's taking place and perhaps maybe even at the heart of some sort of American politics right now around sort of you know, the perspectives on that. Now, our view on this though is, and this is the understanding, crypto, and particularly Web3, actually has very strong anti-monopolistic qualities to it. In fact, the fact that data is an open construct, that you can compose freely on top of it, that you can't have these monopolistic practices is actually of benefit. And I feel like if we can explain that better to them, they'll understand that actually Web3 and crypto is perhaps the answer that they seek to have both a capitalist system that can also be equitable.